It's, uh, thank you, Dr. Gleef, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so today we'll be talking about uh, antibiotic prophylaxis in urology. Uh, we'll start with reviewing the CUA guidelines on this, and we'll briefly touch on the AUA guidelines. And then we'll uh, look at more local data, uh, looking at drug resistance um, here in Vancouver. And lastly, talk about some of the uh, current prescribing practices. Uh, to start with the case quickly, this is what got me uh, started on this topic, a uh, patient at St. Paul's. Um, they came in six days after having a biopsy. Uh, they were quite febrile, tachycardic, uh, no specific symptoms, aside from feeling unwell. Uh, of course, the septic workup was done. They were given uh, very generous dose of antibiotics, and cultures were sent um, prior to me being called. On history, the patient had taken a three-day course of Cipro, um, a day before, the day of, and the day after their biopsy. They tolerated this well, and uh, did well for about five days until they started to feel unwell, uh, and otherwise quite a healthy, healthy gentleman. Uh, Mr. P, he uh, actually responded quite well to this resuscitation, the IV antibiotics. Uh, and we continued these as blood and urine cultures uh, were pending. Now the question though, this is not an uh, exceptional case, it's uh, quite a common case, um, and could this be prevented? Uh, so to start the CUA guidelines, they were published in 2015. Um, they came out of uh, mostly some work in London, um, and for what it's worth actually, there's only two urologists uh, involved in writing this, the rest were actually uh, some internists uh, and some ID specialists. Uh, the need for these guidelines came out of the fact that there's quite a few guidelines for open procedures, but there was nothing in Canada for endoscopic procedures. And in urology, we don't always go through the skin, of course. Uh, there's multiple methods uh, how we operate. And because of this, infection can arise from both skin, rectum, and urinary sources. And to cover uh, infections, the ideal antibiotic here would need good uh, tissue penetration as well as urinary concentration. It would have to cover the relevant pathogens. Uh, it would have to be a, a safe medication to give and ideally um, a reasonable cost if every patient is going to receive it. The objective of these guidelines were to develop evidence-based guidelines for the following five areas. We're going to break each of these down and just spend a couple minutes going through each of these um, essentially types of surgery. Um, to do this, they only looked at randomized controlled trials and they excluded any patients who had an infection prior to the surgery. Uh, they looked through quite an extensive database, uh, going all the way back to 1950 in fact, and they calculated the relative risk of either antibiotics versus a placebo or antibiotics versus no treatment at all. Uh, so to start, uh, we'll look at a transrectal biopsy of the prostate. Now we're going to cover this fairly quickly. Dr. Uh, Patterson actually did an excellent grand rounds on this topic back in 2008. I don't intend to spend the uh, entire morning on this topic, so we will be a little bit brief. This uh, Cochrane review is published in 2011. I uh, looked at nine RCTs. The results were above, they looked at the relative risk, antibiotics versus placebo, of bacteria, bacteremia, fever, a UTI, and hospitalization for any reason. And in all these categories, we can see it is significant that antibiotics reduce the risk. Uh, more interesting, though, they subdivided to look at studies with a one-day course of antibiotics versus a three-day course of antibiotics. These relative risks uh, certainly are trending in the direction of um, favoring the three-day course of antibiotics, but none of them, excuse me, only bacteria um, is statistically significant. And then also looking at just a single dose given at time of biopsy versus uh, multiple doses. And again, bacteria is significant. Fever, urinary tract infection, hospitalization, other um, more clinically relevant uh, factors are not significant, although they certainly are trending in a direction. 
when they broke it into oral antibiotics versus IV antibiotics, uh, there was no significant difference. And so their summary for transrectal biopsy is that antibiotics are recommended for all patients. It's a grade A um, level A recommendation. That means it's based on a meta-analysis of multiple RCTs. Their conclusion was that a single dose versus uh, one day uh, is as effective as three days of antibiotics. And they sort of threw this in the, uh, the end that there's insufficient evidence to recommend pre-procedure enemas. Going through the guidelines, they didn't actually discuss a lot about that. And then they have a statement here that uh, comes up multiple times through the guidelines. Multiple studies um, investigated quinolones, but the choice of agent should be based on the local drug resistance patterns. And actually all five areas essentially have the same statement, uh, which is why the second part of this talk will actually look at those local resistance rates. This uh, grade of recommendation D is essentially based on expert opinion. And lastly in the guidelines they talked about uh, perirectal swabs recommending these patients at high risk of harboring resistant organisms. High risk they define as either previous episodes of urosepsis or patients who'd had multiple treatments with antibiotics prior. They didn't actually discuss this in the guidelines until this statement, interesting enough. If we move on to shockwave therapy, the guidelines here are based on eight RCTs. Again, they only included patients with sterile urine preoperatively, and they here only looked at fever or urinary tract infection. I include this just uh, to look at the eight RCTs uh, included. There's quite a high variation in the duration and selection of antibiotic. Uh, three of them use uh, quinolones, three use cephalosporins, and as well as uh, one with penicillins, aminoglycosides, and one with uh, sulfur-based medication. When we look at the relative risk of urinary tract infection or fever in antibiotics compared to placebo, uh, the relative risk is not significantly different. <coughs> uh, in pictorial form, this is a forest plot of the same data. And as we can see, uh, there would be a trend towards uh, prophylaxis, but it's not significant. Same with fever, it is uh, technically crossing one here, although definitely trending uh, to one direction. So the summary for shockwave therapy is that prophylactic antibiotics do not reduce the risk of UTI or fever. Uh, it is not statistically significant, but uh, to consider it in high-risk patients. High-risk patients they define as those with a large stone burden. They don't uh, actually quantify this, but uh, leave it fairly subjective. Those with pyuria, previous polynephritis, or any adjunctive procedure, so if they're stented. And this is a grade B recommendation, meaning it's based off um, multiple RCTs. And again, uh, the statement, uh, the choice of age, should be based on local patterns of resistance, uh, which we'll look at further on. Next, they look at endoscopic stone surgeries. Uh, namely, this is ureteroscopy versus uh, percutaneous nephrolithotripsy. Uh, there's four RCTs included here, a mix of RCTs dedicated to URS uh, versus PCNL. And again, the same inclusion criteria as previous. Again, there was a variation in the antibiotics given. Uh, one used quinolones, two used cephalosporins, and one used aminoglycoside. Uh, in the outcomes, the relative risk of urinary tract infection is significant when antibiotics are given versus placebo. Uh, fever is not significant. Again, the uh, forest plots of this data showing UTI and fever. Again, trending in a direction, but not mm -hmm. significant. And the summary statement for endoscopic stone procedures is that antibiotics do reduce the risk of UTI and trend towards reducing the risk of fever. For this reason, they should be considered in all patients. And again, the choice of antibiotic should be individualized to the site. Just to speak a little bit more about uh, URS. This is an article with a few familiar names, 
you know, Dr. Chu and Dr. Patterson, as well as Ryan Flanagan. It was published in 2016 and involved um, here as well as uh, Massachusetts as a site. It was a retrospective review of 81 patients, uh, all going undergoing URS. Everyone received preoperative <coughs> antibiotics, and a subset of these patients also received postoperative antibiotics. And the purpose was to evaluate if the addition of these postoperative antibiotics reduced uh, clinically significant UTIs. This is a table looking at the preoperative antibiotics used. Uh, certainly, ANSEF and Cipro were the most common antibiotics. And postoperatively, again, uh, Cipro and Keflux uh, were most common with a spattering of other antibiotics used. The results were actually there's no significant difference. Interestingly enough, in those who only received antibiotics preoperatively, only 4.8% of patients had a uh, urinary tract infection versus those who received preoperative and postoperative antibiotics uh, was 10.2%. Uh, the conclusion from this paper was that they support the CUA guidelines. There were, of course, some limitations. It was a very small sample size. It was retrospective, uh, certainly subject to selection bias, as they're just looking back to see who received antibiotics, and perhaps there was uh, specific reasons why those patients received extra antibiotics. And uh, there was no structured antibiotic regime. It was up to the physician to decide. Were there any cases in either group that went on to become septic and have septic shock? Um, I, believe, uh, I believe two patients developed a urosepsis. The rest were either UTIs or pyelonephritis. And there was two smaller samples of validation? Yes. Good, thank you. Now I'm looking at some work in PCNL. This is actually. Um, a presentation from the AUA this year, uh, so it's fairly hot off the press. Um, I looked at seven sites across North America, and it was an RCT of 68 patients, again a small sample size, looking at uh, if patients who received only preoperative apicillin gentamicin uh, had any lower risk of infection versus those who also received uh, nitrofurantoin for a week preoperatively. It only looked at those who were at low risk for infectious complications, and they defined this as those with negative urine cultures, those who didn't receive antibiotics two weeks prior to surgery, aside from the antibiotics for surgery, and those with no uh, urinary drains uh, catheters present. And the results again was there's no significant difference between the intervention and control arm. They also uh, looked at length of hospital stay, which was also not significant. So again, the conclusion was they support the CUA guidelines. And again, this doesn't apply to all patients. There's a small sample size and only those at low risk of complication. Uh, so moving on to endoscopic procedures, uh, not including stone, manipula stone manipulation. Here they found four RCTs, three of them looking at urodynamics, and one looking at cystoscopy. And again, the same uh, inclusion criteria as previous. Now, they did look to include uh, transurethral resection of bladder tumors, as well as uh, retrograde polygrams, ureteric stents, and uh, internal urethrotomies. They didn't find any good RCTs to involve this. Again, looking, there's a variation between the antibiotics given between quinolones, cephalosporins, and sulfur-based medications. They only looked at uh, UTI, and the relative risk here uh, was not significant in antibiotics versus placebo. In pictorial form, uh, same, there's certainly a trend towards favor in prophylaxis, but not significant. And this is their summary <coughs> statement uh, that they, you know, there's a trend, but there's no significance in reducing UTI. None of them assessed fever, unfortunately. And for this, they say prophylactic antibiotics should be considered in those at high risk of infections, complications. They don't actually define high risk here. Presumably, it's the same classification as uh, for shockwave therapy. This is grade uh, C data, I mean, it, it's extrapolated from an RCT. And then, lastly, in the guidelines, they assessed TERP, 
Uh, so this is based on one systematic review from 2005 that actually looked at 28 different RCTs. Their inclusion criteria were the same, essentially those with sterile preoperative urine. The exclusion criteria uh, are important. The one I do highlight is an indwelling catheter. So those uh, coming in in retention with a catheter in situ uh, were not actually included in these guidelines. Uh, now this is small enough that it essentially is unreadable. Uh, I only put this in to show there was 28 different RCTs. Interestingly enough, uh, half of them looked at cephalosporins, the other half a variety of other antibiotics. Um, none of them actually looked at Cipro, uh, which is obviously commonly used. Only one of them even looked at a quinolone, and that was actually an oxacin, which is no longer on the market. Comparing antibiotics to either placebo or no treatment, uh, there was a significant uh, risk reduction in bacteria, bacteremia, and fever. And all of these outcomes were recorded within one week of TERP. This is also the first spot in the guidelines where any adverse events related to the antibiotics are included. Uh, there was 25 adverse events, mostly rash, nausea, vomiting, um, and diarrhea. No serious events were recorded. And the summary for TERP is that there is a high incidence of adverse events when no antibiotics are given. Uh, bacteria and fever about a quarter of patients, and bacteremia in uh, 1 out of 25 patients. For this reason, they do recommend prophylactic antibiotics in all patients, a grade A recommendation. And again, the choice of agent uh, is based on local drug resistance patterns. And that is a typo. Uh, most did not uh, investigate quinolones. Only one of them did, my mistake. So if we summarize the guidelines, antibiotics are useful in the prevention of fever and UTIs. The guidelines so did not demonstrate any class of antibiotic as superior. They also didn't look at duration of antibiotics, although they do reference multiple other societies who recommend either a single dose or 24 hours of antibiotics. They also note that there's a lack of reporting of adverse outcomes in most of these trials. And uh, the statement that's been all through the guidelines is local antibiotic stewardship programs should develop antibiotic regimes tailored to the uh, local epidemiology of resistance. I will briefly look at the AUA guidelines. We don't have time to summarize them, but just to compare and contrast them to the Canadian guidelines. For lower tract procedures, this is their summary. Um, overall, they're slightly more liberal in giving antibiotics, um, and they include a lot more risk factors, which we'll look at on the next slide. Uh, one major difference, there's a few categories that weren't included in the Canadian guidelines. They don't uh, discuss removing a catheter in the Canadian guidelines. They don't discuss cryotherapy and brachytherapy in the Canadian guidelines. Um, also, true, uh, also as well, uh, transurethral resection of bladder tumor in the American guidelines are grouped in the cystoscopy with tissue manipulation. That includes uh, TERP as well. In the Canadian guidelines, they tried to include uh, resection of bladder tumors um, in things like cystoscopy and urodynamics, uh, essentially classified as no stone manipulation. It's slightly different. Dave? <clears throat> yes? I just, uh, just reviewed a meta-analysis for Cochrane about use of antibiotic in cystoscopy and by tissue manipulation okay. and the tissue manipulation. <coughs> There's no evidence antibiotics needed. So maybe right now probably will change soon after it's done up. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Is there they, they don't give antibiotics for it? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, they like to say either give antibiotics or if high risk. Uh, there's no category that they say don't give antibiotics for. Uh, when they talk about high risk, uh, they separate this into categories of uh, those that impair natural defense mechanisms. Again, they're quite open to interpretation, advanced age. Uh, it's not defined. I don't know what that means. It's one day older than me. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, they also look at uh, increase in bacterial concentrations, so things like an indwelling catheter as high risk. Uh, 
Uh, the guidelines for upper tract um, are essentially agreeable to the Canadian guidelines in that shockwave therapy should have antibiotics in high-risk patients, uteroscopy and PNL, uh, they should all receive antibiotics. Uh, so moving on, I wanted to look at the local patterns of resistance. I'm just going to plug two apps uh, briefly. This first one called Spectrum is actually a free app put out by Providence Health. Um, it's a combination of uh, Vancouver, Calgary, and Halifax uh, data. And you can actually separate it by city, so it is tailored just to Vancouver. Uh, it's quite a nice app, and I did use this a fair bit uh, in the next few slides. As well, Bugs and Drugs is uh, quite helpful. The app costs $20, uh, but it's actually free online. And again, quite useful. Um, I will note, though, you have to do bugsanddrugs.org, uh, not .ca, uh, to get free access. Um, so first, I just broke down uh, five common antibiotics we use, and a little bit more info about them. So ciprofloxacin, of course. Uh, it is a fluoroquinolone second generation. Uh, mechanism of action is it inhibits DNA gyrase to prevent cell division. In terms of highlighting, uh, pregnancy risk is uh, pregnancy C category. That means risk cannot be ruled out, um, and either there's no controlled studies in women or animal studies have shown um, either risk or they just haven't been done. Um, of note, the bioavailability given IV or PO at the listed doses are equivalent, um, and the cost is certainly not equivalent. Uh, moving on to SEPTRA, um, it inhibits the folate synthesis pathway, slightly longer time to peak and longer half-life than Cipro. The pregnancy category is D, uh, meaning that there is evidence of risk, either potential fetal risk, uh, but it can be considered if the benefits to the mother, mother are thought to outweigh the risk to the fetus. Uh, and it is quite cheap, of course, 12 cents. Uh, per uh, double strength tab. Um, ANCEF, uh, first generation cephalosporin, IV of course. Uh, much quicker time of onset, um, given this is an IV antibiotic. Functions by inhibiting uh, peptidoglycan synthesis in the cell wall as a beta-lactam. Uh, pregnancy B, meaning there's no evidence of risk, but there's also no controlled studies in women. Um, animal studies will show no risk. Uh, and again, quite cheap for an IV antibiotic. All these prices are actually specific for Vancouver as well. Um, gentamicin uh, binds the 30S subunits of the bacterial ribosome to uh, inhibit protein synthesis. Uh, pregnancy category D. And this price, um, as far as I can find, is actually based off just a regular 70 kilogram weight patient. A little bit pricey. And then lastly, looked at clindamycin briefly. Now I will note, um, in discussion with one of the uh, ID specialists, Dr. Grant, uh, they're saying this should not be used as prophylaxis for urinary procedures isolated to the GU system because the uh, urinary penetration is minimal, less than 10%. But it can be useful um, if operating through the skin or through the rectum. Uh, otherwise, pregnancy category B. Um, so this is uh, some data that was compiled from a few sources uh, to try and come up with a useful uh, table to reference. Um, what we have is the first four categories are different gram-positive bacteria that are um, commonly or can be seen as seropathogens. The bottom four are common gram-negative bacteria. Um, e. coli I have highlighted since that is the predominant uh, bacteria um, of the urinary system that we'd be treating. And this data is uh, based on uh, several sites. The first one is looking at uh, both VGH and UBC data that was published in 2015. And the second is uh, using the Spectrum app that was uh, updated this year, looking at uh, Providence Health resistance patterns. So if we look, uh, this is first starting with Cipro. Uh, Cipro covers you know, staff if it's MSSA. Um, quite well, 84% of organisms are susceptible. This is in vitro testing. Whereas, of course, MRSA has very poor coverage. I'll highlight E. coli is about 
75% uh, susceptible. <coughs> and the rest of the gram-negative antibiotics are in that range as well. There's occasionally a range to these numbers if the VGH data and the Providence Health data were slightly different. Uh, simply, I just average those to try and keep it clean. Uh, and then we'll look at the next antibiotic we discussed, the SEPTRA. Again, quite good coverage of staph, regardless of if it's MSSA or MRSA. Uh, poor coverage of um, non staph or uh, coagulase negative staph. E. coli, again, it sits around 70% uh, susceptibility. Um, and of note, Pseudomonas isn't covered uh, by SEPTRA. Looking at ANSEF, um, of course, good coverage of staph orders um, and not sensitive uh, by definition to MRSA. Um, e. coli, um, slightly better coverage, 83%, but again, not great. Um, and quite poor coverage of Proteus and resistant uh, Pseudomonas. I'm looking at gentamicin, uh, covers gram-negative bacteria. Um, relatively good coverage, 89% of E. coli. Um, and even slightly better coverage of Klebsiella, Proteus, uh, and Pseudomonas. And then our last antibiotic, clindamycin, looking at gram-positive uh, bacteria. Again, surprisingly uh, not great numbers um, in terms of coverage of staph um, or enterococcus. Uh, so this is just a summary of some common antibiotics and data in Vancouver. Now, I didn't make a table for it, but of note, some other antibiotics uh, that I looked at. Uh, vancomycin has 99 to 100% uh, coverage of all the gram positives listed here. Uh, Piptazo is listed about 92 to 99% of coverage. Uh, Mirapenem is 99 to 100% across the board. Uh, so there are antibiotics uh, that are very reliable, but of course, um, it's not ideal to use those in every patient. I was looking at a uh, study published from the CDC here in BC uh, in 2011. I'm just going to talk a little bit about ciprofloxacin from it. It's uh, several hundred pages, so i just highlight one small section. An interesting table here that looks at E. coli resistance uh, with ciprofloxacin uh, subdivided to patient age. Now previously the susceptibility uh, listed at 76% or 24% resistance rate. Here, if we look, uh, ages less than 50 years old, the resistance rate is about 10%. But if we look at people over the age of 80 years old, it's actually pushing 50%. Uh, now, I talked with Dr. Grant uh, from Infectious Disease about this table and why uh, we think there's such a high resistance in those uh, of higher age. And essentially, the answer is we don't know, but we suspect it's due to just increased exposure to both ciprofloxacin or other antibiotics as people age, and this causes a greater selection uh, for resistance. And this is a brief uh, table looking at um, Klebsiella E. coli as well as Proteus in relation to ciprofloxacin. Um, highlighting E. coli, which is in blue here. We can see in 1999 the uh, rate of resistance was quite low, less than 5%. Uh, once we hit 2007, it's above 20%. And there is a slight trend uh, to increasing prescriptions of Cipro as well. Again, causation, correlation, uh, we don't know. Um, still harping on Cipro a little bit. Um, this is something that I don't know if patients uh, who are well read bring up. Uh, fluoroquinolone induced tendinopathy. This is a black box warning uh, was released from the FDA in 2016. Uh, black box warning being the strictest uh, warning they can release uh, about a medication. And it uh, means that there's reasonable evidence of an association of a serious hazard with the drug. Looking at uh, a study that has uh, some case control and cohort studies, looking at this further is done in 2013 um, in Switzerland. Uh, they broke it into 16 different studies and overall they found the incidence of tendon injury to be quite low, uh, 0.08 to 0.2% in this population. 
They did summarize there is an increased risk of tendon rupture with an odds ratio of two if the patient is treated with a fluoroquinolone. Uh, but they did subdivide this into different risk factors. They found age is quite significant, especially over 80 years old, as well as uh, concurrent corticosteroid use. This is either oral or IV use, uh, not topical corticosteroids. Uh, one study had an odds ratio of 43 with corticosteroid use and Cipro together. There are also multiple other uh, risk factors that are theorized, but they weren't uh, looked at directly in this study. So the conclusion of this review was that it's quite an uncommon condition. Tendon rupture, if it's going to happen, usually occurs within one month of exposure to quinolones. They think that it may be dose dependent, uh, but that needs further study. There are case reports, though, of just a single dose of quinolones resulting uh, or being associated with tendon rupture. A problem in the literature is there's a very wide spectrum of disease. Some studies include just pain over a tendon, whereas some only include true tendon rupture. And these studies do rely on patient self-reporting. <clears throat> I'm going to take a brief side note to look at uh, C. diff. Uh, starting uh, with the meta-analysis, uh, this is in community-associated C. diff, so it's not entirely applicable to our population of prophylactic antibiotics, but I think it is helpful. Here they looked at six case control studies and a cohort study with the objective of determining if there is an association between antibiotic class and risk of C. diff. Mm -hmm. When they determined the odds ratios, uh, of course clindamycin uh, was at the top of the list with an odds ratio of 16. Unfortunately, most of the other antibiotics we like to use in urology are within the top couple categories, cephalosporins and fluoroquinolones. The only antibiotic class not associated with increased odds ratio was tetracyclines. Their conclusion is that perhaps the avoidance of high-risk antibiotics in favor of lower-risk antibiotics would reduce the incidences of C. diff. Again, there are some limitations in applying this uh, to our population. It's non-surgical patients didn't look at antibiotic duration or dose. Uh, if we look at analysis uh, from the VA hospitals uh, published in JAMA Surgery in 2016, it was a retrospective observational study. 134 hospitals, um, about half a million procedures. Uh, the surgical specialties did include urology. And their main outcome was uh, post-operative C. diff within 30 days. And they found an overall rate of this of 0.4%. Their, sum their summary was that there is an increased risk of postoperative C. diff when multiple classes of preoperative antibiotics are given. This isn't directly looking at prophylactic antibiotics. And the table here they summarize uh, those who did develop C. diff, 29% of them had received three or more different classes of antibiotics within 60 days of surgery. Whereas those who did not develop C. diff, only 7.5% of them had received three or more classes of antibiotics. Um, and the last study looking at C. diff I wanted to review is this one, post-operative burden of hospital-acquired C. diff. I think this is probably the most relevant uh, to our practice. It was a retrospective observational study from Michigan done in 2012 to 13. I uh, looked at 35,000 different procedures. Unfortunately, it didn't actually include specific urology procedures. Their outcome was the same 30-day incidence of C. diff, and the rate was uh, comparable to the previous study, 0.5% here. Uh, their summary was that the use of prophylactic antibiotics was not independently associated with risk of C. diff postoperatively. Essentially, those who did not get C. diff, 4.2% of them had no antibiotic prophylaxis given, and 82% had antibiotic prophylaxis. In those who did get C. diff, 5% uh, had no antibiotic prophylaxis, and 71% uh, did. They didn't find this to be statist statistically significant. So perhaps one dose of preoperative antibiotics don't actually increase risk of C. diff. The literature is a bit divided. So the others in this study or the previous one, sir? Well, a lot of people 
this area do not have antibiotic prophylaxis, we soon presumably picked it up somewhere. Yes. And so was it the nosocomial hospital? As far as I'm aware, they, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. They looked at 30 day incidents. Presumably, uh, most of these were picked up in hospital, but I don't know if they uh, subdivided uh, that further. Now, a quick side note looking at uh, antibiotics and anaphylaxis. Uh, this is a review uh, from 2003. Uh, this is the instance of all cause perioperative anaphylaxis, um, is 1 in 4,000 to 1 in 25,000, so quite rare. And the causes of this are thought to be most commonly from neuromuscular blockers. The second most common is latex. And finally, the third most common is antibiotics. Of though the antibiotics causing anaphylaxis, the majority, 70%, are from either penicillins or cephalosporins. <clears throat> and the overall instance of an anaphylactic penicillin allergy in the community is estimated at uh, 0.01%. Another stat is uh, from the Bugs and Drugs uh, website that we discussed earlier. They say less than 10% of patients who actually report a penicillin allergy truly have an IG mediated allergy on testing. And interestingly enough, those who truly do have an IG, IgE-mediated reaction, 50% of them lose the sensitivity within 5 years, and 80% lose that within 10 years. There is cross-reactivity, of course, between penicillins and cephalosporins and carbapenems. Uh, both cephalosporins and carbapenems, approximately 2.5% uh, rate of cross-reactivity. The recommendations from bugs and drugs if there's a questionable or a distant, uh, more than 10 year uh, removed allergy, to try a graded penicillin or cephalosporin challenge, essentially giving a one hundredth of the dose, then one tenth of the dose, and then the full dose. If there's either a convincing or a definite allergy, they do recommend either avoiding beta lactams or uh, penicillin desensitization. Looking at uh, endocarditis prophylaxis, this is the American Heart Association guideline. It was originally released in 1997 and updated in 2007. There's some rules that for dental procedures, they only recommend prophylaxis in high-risk patients. Um, as described previously, these high-risk conditions are those that are associated with the highest risk of adverse outcomes from infectious endocarditis. They do say in terms of dental procedures, though, that patients are actually more likely to be bacteremic from activities of daily living than from a dental procedure. And then in terms of GI and GU tract procedures, they don't recommend any prophylaxis. And their statement is that the administration of antibiotics solely to prevent endocarditis is not recommended for patients who undergo a genitourinary or gastrointestinal tract procedure. And a quick side looking at uh, prosthetic joint infections and if prophylaxis is needed in that case. This is looking at the AUA best practice statement, uh, most recently amended in 2012, and I've noted agrees with the um, Academy, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons uh, recommendations. This is that antibiotic prophylaxis should not be routinely used in those patients who have a prosthetic joint, but it is indicated if they have both these risk factors. So the first being a patient with a high risk of hematogenous joint infection. They define that as those who are within two years of having the joint replaced, those who are immunocompromised, or those who have had a previous prosthetic joint infection. They need one of those combined with a high risk urologic procedure. And interestingly enough, in terms of a high risk urologic procedure, essentially all these patients require preoperative antibiotics, anyways. It's just the exact antibiotics prescribed are slightly different for endocarditis prophylaxis. They do note that uh, patients with orthopedic pins, plates, or screws do not, uh, are not included in these guidelines. It's simply for prosthetic joints. Uh, to tie things together, going back to a case study, Mr. P, who was admitted uh, after his prostate biopsy septic, uh, he was stable on the ward on Piptazo. Um, of course, the blood cultures uh, didn't come back anything, but the urine cultures, uh, they grew E. coli, not a surprise. And this E. coli was resistant to Cipro, not uncommon as we saw in the data earlier. Uh, fortunately, it was susceptible to all the other antibiotics tested. 
And I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, thank Dr. Ben Chu uh, for his help putting this together, as well as Dr. Jennifer Grant. Uh, she's the uh, she's from ID. <coughs> she's also the director of the Aspires program here at uh, VGH. Um, this table is just a summary of the CUA guidelines. Um, if anyone is interested, um, I'd be happy to either take questions or if there's any uh, questions or discussion about the guidelines or how we prescribe antibiotics, that'd be awesome.